Welcome to EECS 373, Introduction to Metasystems. I'm Langston Sample, and uh, this module is uh, Serial Bus uh, UART. All right, so looking at uh, where we are in the course, this is part of Section 5, where we have four mini-modules on uh, UART, Serial Bus Protocols. Uh, and this particular one is on uh, the UART, so the Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter Protocol. All right, so um, just so you have some reference, um, you know, the main source of information is, is the reference manual, who has the details and chapters or sections 50 and 51 on uh, UART, um, and then background reading material is in the embed systems with ARM Cortex M microcontrollers, uh, uh, chapter 22. And there's lots of uh, information on the web as well. These are very standard protocols that are. I uh, used multiple times. Um, okay. So, um, so talk about the UART here. So this is a um, the core idea about this is this is an asynchronous protocol, transmit and receive. And it's based on a piece of computer hardware which translates data from parallel to serial, right? This really is just built around shift registers, okay? so. Um, we're going to see that this is an old protocol, and really it's just the idea of taking parallel information, your, your, um, your bus structures from the peripheral bus or uh, the high-performance bus, and translating that into something that's serial. Okay? So we're going to we're, just keep that idea in the back of your, your mind. Um, UR is uh, commonly used in conjunction with uh, different standards. So we think about, in this class, we'll think about UR as chip-to-chip -chip communication, but you can also do chip-to-device communication. So you can go off your PCB uh, with standards like RS-232 or RS-422. These are different standards um, that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, what's interesting is that uh, UART has a kind of two pieces. There's a the universal part designates that there, it defines a particular data format and configuration speeds. Um, but then there's also um, standards for electrical signaling, which is can, handled by device drivers and driver circuits. So from an information point of view, you have a, your UART will define um, uh, speeds and data format, and then it'll send signals out. But if you want to do extra things with it, uh, so in our case, um, those signals can go straight to another chip, no problem. Uh, but if you wanted to do one of these other protocols, like RS-232, which would take uh, your uh, chip and have it talk to a computer, you need a driver chip in between. And that driver chip defines voltages and uh, current levels and some other things like that. Okay. So a little history. Uh, UART has been around from since 1971, so before I was born. Wow! Why in the world, you might be asking, are we talking about a protocol that was around before Professor Sample was even born? That sounds really old. Yes, it is. Um, but it's built on a very simple idea, and that's the, the shift register. Taking in parallel information, turning it into serial, taking in serial information, taking it and putting it back into parallel. So mechanisms that can, your computer, right, uh, as a parallel device, it takes information parallel, but to get things going a long distance, we need uh, use something that's serial. Um, so it converts these two worlds. Uh, they've been on computers back since the 70s, early 2000s, they all have these serial ports on them. Um, so there was this rich infrastructure, and in fact, before Ethernet, a common way to send data between computers was to use RS-232. Um, kind of insane. Um, so, you know, why, if this is all old technology, are we still using it? Why are there literally billions of UARTs uh, sold and distributed and used today? Um, and that's really because of the simplicity, and we've had a protocol available to, the, to us as PCB designers and embedded system designers, and we said, well, we already have chips in the standard, let's just reuse it. So it's, this uh, protocol has been very flexible, uh, adaptable, and rugged. Um, so it's just, it's just stayed around with us. Um, originally, 
It was all based around uh, what we call a DB9 connector. I don't even remember what DB stands for. Um, there's like DB9 and DB15, and it's just the, the number just indicates the number of pins on them. And so there's these standard uh, interfaces. Um, and by today's standards, they're all very large mechanically, but they're rugged, um, which is nice. Anyways, originally, um, when you're talking from one computer to another computer, um, you would uh, have transmit and receive, which we still use today, a ground pin. Still need to have that. But you need to have all these other arbitration signals like send clear and ready send and all these other things to help the communication. In fact, um, part of that standard uh, was that you could have these in ring topologies. So you have one computer um, talking to another computer and so on and so forth in a big ring. Or if you wanted to have um, different topologies, you could have um, tri states and muxes in there so that you could control the flow of information. That's with some of these extra signals. Anyways, um, you could use multi-party buff buses. Uh, it was pretty flexible tri-states, but again, this was 1980s, 1990s technology. Um, sometimes it's still useful to use. Uh, I remember using RS-232 when I was in your shoes, when I was uh, an undergrad doing research. Um, you know, you want to send data from one device to another device and you want to go over 100 feet. Um, you know, Ethernet is fine, but it's complicated. And RS-232 is a viable option. Um, one thing that tripped me up, I remember being a uh, junior in a research lab talking to these fancy uh, graduate students and trying to figure out why in the world you know, my little device here, I had a little microcontroller that was sending out five volts. So five volts and then, you know, encoding data as time series um, square waves. And why was it inverted, right? Why was it going through when it went through that chip? So we had a UART would go into a RS-232 chip that would take five volts in and kick it up to 12 volts plus or minus so that we could send it really, really far. And the signal, you'd have bigger, better signal to noise ratio um, you know, if these, if this got corrupted, there would be a lot of swing here for, to be able to detect or if it got attenuated. Anyways, why was it inverted? Um, you know, I was afraid to ask. I asked some graduate student and they didn't know. And I was like, oh no, it's a disaster. But it just turned out that the chip that's inside an RS-232 chip is inverted, is an inverter, just a big beefy one. And that it, the receiver chip of an RS-232 chip, the receiver side just reinverts it and then sends it back on to the next chip uh, in the way it would be expected. So, a little piece of history there. Anyways, for you guys, um, for today's chips, we don't need an RS-232 chips in between that kick it up to 15, 12 volts or whatever the voltage is. Uh, we send one chip directly to another chip. Um, we don't need all those flow control chips or those extra lines that we saw in the DBI or DB9 connector. We're just going to use transmit and receive, okay? So the RDX signal is a signal that goes, a uh, zero signal um, that receives data, and the TXD signal, or just sometimes you say TX, is the signal that's transmitted. So if you got two devices, like we have here, uh, there's, no, there's no controller, there's nobody in charge, in a sense. So device one, it transmits, it has to go to the receive. And device two has to go, its transmitter has to go to the other guy's receiver. I mean, you have to cross them. Um, boy, you know, I've certainly made um, that mistake a few times, or at least once. You always make that mistake once on the PCB at some point. You just take the transmit to transmit and the receive to receive, forgetting that it's from the device's point of view, not from just one device. It's not device's one's point of view. It's each device's point of view individually. And, you know, I had a board that doesn't work. Um, there's a nice, simple um, uh, resistor trick you can do about how you lay out your stuff so that you can um, do it and post and switch it around. Um, anyways, it's easy, you know, if, if you've made your PCB right to, to correct for that, and usually now I do. Uh, just make my PCB so it's easy if you make a mistake to, to rewire it quickly. Anyways, so you got device one is going to transmit on its transmitter to the receiver of device two, and likewise, device two is going to transmit data out serially 
to, um, to the first device. Um, we always talk about these things being a, uh, you know, a two-wire interface. Here you only need two wires. The reality is you actually need three wires. Uh, you need ground. You need a reference signal. Um, you don't need power necessarily. They can be powered independently. Um, but if you don't have that ground wire between them, you know, no current's going to flow from this one to the other one. Um, you're not going to get that signal. Or they could be floating, right? You can have something that's floating really high and, you know, it's going to get corrupted. So common mistake sometimes in 373, you connect everything up. Data is sporadic. We're not happening transmitting at all. Don't forget to send the ground wire. So for all the communication protocols we talked about, don't forget the ground wire. Um, but the other thing to think about, there's no clock here. So how is it possible that we're going to send these serial streams of data back and forth uh, without a clock? So uh, for your Nucleo boards, for your chip itself, but also for all UARTs uh, work the same. This is just a, a module here. And it because this is old technology, it's sometimes just dirt simple. Um, so uh, we'll talk about the oversampling synchronizer in a second, but basically you get some data in, it goes into a shift register and sends back out to, uh, sends to external, uh, or not external, but uh, registers here, which we'll talk on your APB, right? So this really, this shift registers in the details. Actually, we can take a little bit closer view. This is literally like, uh, both these diagrams are just showing data comes in. It, there's a synchronizer that has to occur, basically. But then data comes in your shift register and it's just pushed out as parallel bits on into a, a register that's on the APB. So let's see. Let's take a look at that. Just because I want to make it crystal clear, uh, you all know by now my, my love of false data as a simulation tool for, for teaching. Um, so here is... This is all, this is a four bit shift register, right? Um, in this case, we're gonna go, shift registers can be universal, meaning they go from parallel to serial, this one, or serial to parallel back and forth, or they can just be serial to parallel or just parallel to serial. Anyways, in this case, we have a serial data coming in. I'll toggle this pin and we'll see it show up here in four clock cycles. Um, so here is the, um, the scope probe for this one, and here are the four bits over here, all right? So, I put that high and you can start seeing each clock cycle where that high gets propagated through. In fact, after four clock cycles, you can see it here. Um, so now I've sent all ones. So let's set a bit stream here. Do, do. I might not get it, the timing just right, but you can start seeing, let's stop the simulation, that I sent some ones and zeros in and it, they were clocked in and now I have one zero one zero here and now you could pull that data right out uh, on a parallel bus and take your serial data and turn it into parallel. All I had to do was clock it into just a couple D flip flops. All right. So that is the that's the heart of a UART. is just a uh, set of shift registers made out of D flip flops. But you have to know when to latch them in, right? Uh, this had an a internal clock. This would be internal to the um, microcontroller. So how do we figure out when to clock the data coming in? Um, that is the job. Actually, oops, let me talk about the data frame first, then we'll get to the synchronizer in a second. Um, so typically, um, uh, the, the types of data uh, and the way the data is laid out is well defined. So you have a start bit. Start bit uh, you have, uh, in this case, eight uh, bit values, either going to be high or low. Uh, there's an optional parity bit and a stop bit. Um, so start and stop bits are good for your synchronizer to kind of get phased up and, and figure out where to look. Um, you can actually, in this protocol, have, um, you can be uh, LSB or MSB. You have to decide as part of how you're putting data into these things. And you can set your data size if you want five, six, seven, or eight bits, but you can't do larger bits than that. You just have to send multiple packets. Um, 
Sender and receiver, of course, would be using the same uh, speed for transmitting. The challenge is both of them have to know a priori what it is, right? So both your transmitter and receiver have to be on the same baud rate. If they're not, it's a problem. Um, and built into this typically, and this is this can be a variable here, but typically you can get a 10% a clock shift. Um, one can go 10% faster than the other one. Um, and like 10% is a huge amount, like, good gosh, uh, we're talking about those crystals that are, you know, accurate with parts per million. And now you're talking 10%. Well, how does, how did they, why did they make a protocol that was off by 10%? Uh, well, it's important to remember in the seventies, things were not that precise. Um, you know, just having stable clocks that didn't drift over time, uh, was not a given. And so, because you're going to have these two computing devices that could be a long ways away, uh, you know, 100 meters or so, or 100 feet, um, you know, it was important to be tolerant of, of different top clock timing. Okay. It's also good just to take, uh, just a look, this is from the actual uh, data sheet for um, MS, or sorry, the uh, L LSDM. Um, so here's just different encodings, right? You can have a 9-bit uh, word, 8-bit word, 7-bit word, and then you have options if you're going to have stop. So you'll see some of these different things like 8N uh, stop, uh, one stop, of uh, different types of encoding. All right, so let's talk about how we recover the timing of this asynchronous bus. So the typical way to do this is the oversample, right? So they have a clock that goes eight or 16 times faster than you actually need. Um, and so what happens is it uses a start bit to go through and it start, it's clocking, overclocking, overclocking, overclocking. And it figures out where the falling edge is and it figures out where the um, rising edge is and it picks the midpoint. And then it says, aha, in, in this case, we are doing uh, eight, uh, eight cycle overclocking. And so it says, okay, well, I know where I'm supposed to be here. Now I'm just gonna um, advance by 16 clocks and then wherever that is I'm just gonna blindly take that boom that's where the data is so this is a nice way to synchronize uh, to gain the um, to figure out where the phase is or when these edges are gonna go you figure it out on the start bit and then you know for this eight bits that you're gonna be sampling in the middle Um, one thing that's kind of nice to think about, or interesting, is why, what's the challenge with this if you were going with a protocol with lots and lots of bits in it, right? So being eight bits, it's unlikely you're gonna get off, right? You take this sample here, bit zero, okay, wait another 16 cycles, all right, bit one, probably gonna get in the middle, and by the time you get out to eight, it's unlikely that they're gonna be too far off. Um, and that's kind of, why they say 10% tolerance, because in eight bits, it's unlikely you're gonna be so many cycles off here that you're sampling in the danger zone, right? Um, so if you had a very, if you had bit lengths that are much larger, you'd have to have, be much more precise and uh, uh, maybe, maybe have more precise timing up front and also have more um, precise timing requirements about the amount of tolerance that you could have. Okay, so anyways, um, this, bit timing and recovery is done right inside your module. Let me, let's go back for a second. Let's look at that. Hey, 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 hey. Oh, no, no, wrong way. Back, Johnny. Um, that is what the baud rate generator and oversampling circuit does. So from your point of view as a programmer, this magic module is basically figuring out the appropriate timing. Sorry. When you give it the baud rate, it figures out where the middle of the packet is, uh, what's coming in from the receive channel, and then appropriately clocking it into the RF shift register, which is then clocked into the um, buffer uh, that's ready to be received from the APP, APB bridge. All right. Okay, so let's talk about, uh, you know, baud rate versus data rate. Um, so this is historically used in the telecommunication to represent the number of pulses physically transmitted uh, per second. So um, the number of symbols here, not necessarily the amount of data, right? So there's overhead associated with this. We can take an example. 
Um, this would be a slow baud rate. So um, if your baud rate uh, was 9600, say that each frame has a start bit, uh, eight bits, and these are all settings you get to choose, right? So you can, I think you always have to have a start bit, but you can choose the number of bits if you're going to have a stop bit or not, and if you're going to have a parity bit. Um, anyway, so let's just say you choose this, a start bit, eight bits of data, a stop bit, and no parity bits. So when you're asked, uh, calculate uh, the transmission rate. What's, uh, what is that? So you could say, okay, let's take 9,600, divided by eight, there you go. Um, you know, 1200 bits per second. Um, not, not exactly, you gotta take over, you gotta consider the overhead, right? So here, there's a transition here um, for the start bit and the stop bit, as well as your eight bits of data. So now you're, you know, you had to decrease your amount of uh, bits that go across. So even though you have your baud rate, which is 9600, your bit rate is 960 bits per second. Uh, right, so start and stop bits are considered protocol overhead. Um, now, oftentimes what students say is, okay, well, I choose the fast bit rate, um, but how come I'm not getting as data, as much data as I thought through? I, you know, why am I not getting the high data rates? Well, excuse me, you have to think about channel utilization here. All right, so if your microcontroller isn't sending out those eight, those packets very often, you could be sending an individual packet out very quickly, but you may not be filling the channel, right? Um, so you have to think about how to design your protocol, if you need speed, design your uh, interrupt service routines um, and your program so that you can fill that data into that buffer as fast as possible and have it sent over the line. Likewise, whatever is receiving that has to be able to, to um, take the data and respond to it quickly enough. So if you send lots and lots of packets, but uh, your receiver is slow, maybe it's trying to just doing polling instead of an ISR, um, you could send you know, two packets worth of data before this thing responds and all of a sudden you've lost data because that shift register is just going to overwrite. Um, it's just going to shift bits in. Um, we talked about the parity bit. Um, parity bit is just a super useful way of detecting errors. Um, so it's called even parity if the total number of ones in your packet uh, is even, and it's odd parity if the total number of ones in the packet is an odd. Okay? Super easy. So one thing you can do is, you know, uh, you send a bit, before you send it, you calculate, okay, look how many, I'm going to send this ASCII character over, very common for um, uh, uh, UARTs. I send this ASCII character over, I go calculate the number of ones in this thing, okay, I have five ones, therefore uh, my parity is odd, okay, set my parity to zero, um, and send that along with a packet, and then on the receive side, you can just count the number of ones and say, ah, Wait a second. This isn't. This does match or doesn't match. If it doesn't match, super easy. You can just ask for another packet, right? That's a piece of the protocol above hand. You have to pro. You have to actually figure out how to catch that error and do something with it. I mean, sorry. The hardware is going to figure out how to catch the error if you've enabled it. But then you have to do something about it. So you'd have to go back and say, ah, I'm missing packet 58 or whatever it is. Who knows? Okay. Um. And again, this is this is done. Parity uh, checking is done in the hardware. We have this nice advanced hardware, so you don't actually have to write that yourself. All right. Um, here's just a timing diagram showing off uh, transmitting a couple bits here. Uh, we can see um, we're at a baud rate of 9600. Uh, we have a start bit. We have a stop bit here. Um, no parity, and we can actually see that the time, so this is time, this is function of time. Um, we can see 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. So some, in some ways with your little logic analyzers or oscilloscope, it's pretty easy to diagnose and debug these buses, okay? And in this particular example, it's LSB first. Um, it's interesting, it's important to think about how you 
you have to have a clock that's um, appropriate for your baud rate. Okay? Um, so you could imagine if you were running at the wrong clock speed, that might not translate to a baud rate that's appropriate. Um, so there's tables, you can find them online. Um, there's also built into the HAL drivers that will figure out, oh, okay, you wanted this baud rate. So say you wanted something fast, uh, like uh, uh, 11, 52, 0, 0. Um, you wanted something pretty fast, well, what, oops, what clock do I have to send into my UART module so that, I'm, so that I'm sampling at the right rate? And here, I've assumed uh, 16 is a little bit more standard than 8, so assume that you're sampling 16 times. Um, so here, you can just see this is what the, uh, the clock frequency of... Um, of the, the, that needs to be generated and sent to the UART module. So uh, it's just important to think about that um, there is a clock rate for each particular baud rate. Um, because there's tolerance in the spec, you don't actually have to hit it with, you know, 18, uh, you know, 43.2 hertz, boy, you know, kilohertz, boy, that might be, you know, getting that sort of resolution may be hard, who knows. Your watch crystals uh, usually doesn't come from a watch crystal, but say your your DCO, your digitally controlled oscillator might not be exactly that, or the PLL might not be able to generate that, or your your uh, prescaler may not be able to prescale scale down to exactly half a hertz. Um, if that happens, you may find that there's an error rate associated with it. Um, your your timing may get off enough that statistically you get more and more errors. And so you can also look at the tables just to figure out, there, there are tables online, just to figure out for this baud rate and this frequency, uh, this not an ideal frequency, what's my error rate? And it's just good to keep in the back of your mind. Anyways, for the purpose of this class, 90% of the problems are uh, TX, RX, not, not connected, not inversed. Uh, the two devices have different baud rates and they don't understand what's going on. And sometimes the clock you're sending in doesn't equal the baud rate that you expect. Um, we can kind of look from programmatically, how would the core deal with, um, or how do you deal with UARTs? So um, the, the best way to do it is to throw it in an interrupt service routine. Um, you set your, you have some serial data coming into this shift register. Uh, you've set it up with the appropriate frequencies set it up to send off an IR, an IRQ when the hardware has updated um, the receive register, IRQ comes off, you go scoop that data out of the register, uh, store it somewhere to be processed later, and then go back uh, along your way, right? So what happens in this case is, you know, you might send something um, or and this is a sending and receiving example, but uh, you might send something, uh, but you have to, you have multiple bytes you want to send. Well, you don't want to just wait there and keep pushing it in. You set up your IR, your um, your IRQ so that it goes off, uh, and then you just in your IRQ you just have a buffer that you're trying to send out. So whatever internal buffer you want to make, it just whatever size it is, you grab it out, send it, send it, send it, send it until it's over with. Right. So there's a programmatic way to deal with it. <coughs> okay. Um, so UARTs uh, still have a lot of utility. We've talked about uh, one of the most common ways and one of the ways it's actually implemented on your STM boards is the idea that you will use the UR to send serial data over and then you have some helper chip which turns that into USB. Um, now you could have a full USB controller on your microcontroller. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, just USB is pretty darn complicated because remember you're trying to get you know, megabytes of data back and forth and maybe even gigabytes of data. Um, so typically in the microcontrollers that you'd see in this class and maybe 473, um, usually you'd want to use this external chip and um, the FTDI chips uh, there's a company that's 
originally came out with them, and now there's a, um, a whole set, a whole bunch of them exist on the market, which basically interface UR into something else. And this is super nice. The UR takes care of, or this chip takes care of all the little special USB specific things, and you just send UR data back and forth, and it pops up as a terminal, as a serial terminal on your computer, and you'll see this in Lab 5. We'll use this just to display data. Um, here's just another example of it, uh, FDDI chip. Um, what's also nice about this is you can get power uh, from the USB to power everything your board. So here's an example, FDDI actually puts in linear regulators and that sort of stuff to um, control the rest of your board, as well as um, all the extra logic you need to translate USB into UART. Likewise, it doesn't have to just be USB. Remember, Bluetooth is a replacement for USB in a lot of ways, or serial communication. So uh, we have lots of little modules here that will take uh, one UART, um, say the Discovery Kit or uh, any, any STM product or any microcontroller talks UART to a Bluetooth module that sets up a link between uh, two, uh, two devices and you can talk back and forth. And so it's very common to have some little robot module that you program talk back to a base station over uh, Bluetooth. And what's nice is uh, as a system designer, you don't have to be an expert in Bluetooth. You don't have to know how radios work at a low level. You just get a module that's already FCC certified, has antennas in it. You provide power and you are a little pre-configuration and you're good to go. <clears throat> All right, um, so on the STM32L4, you have a whole bunch of uh, UARTs actually. Um, you know, Matt made sure to get you guys a very high-end chip, which was pretty awesome. Um, so there's uh, three multi-purpose UARTs, which um, they call them in their synchronous UARTs, which is a kind of uh, a special term um, which you can use the hardware to do multiple different protocols. For instance, you could do um, IR data, um, it can be repurposed for a bunch of different things, um, but they're there for you to use. You also have just the normal UART without the synchronous. Um, so you get two of those as well as a low power UART, um, which has been specifically optimized so that it can be woken up um, and doesn't consume much power. So you have these, you can have the chip asleep, a signal comes in, it wakes up, that peripheral, the peripheral looks at the data and decides if it needs to wake up the core. Uh, the buffer size for all these is eight, and each of these uh, uh, um, UART modules and USART modules all have dedicated IRQ lines. So you can set them up to set up an interrupt. Um, you will have to go in and figure out, well, what happened in the side of that module. You have to check the configuration flags uh, or the event flags, um, but each one is interruptible. All right, so to summarize here, pros and cons of UART. Um, so pros, only two wires, no clock necessary. So um, pretty simple from a hardware point of view of what you have to implement. Um, you also have a parity bit for error checking, which is pretty nice. The cons is your data frames limited to, to nine bits. You know, practically we always use eight bits. Um, so that does mean that you have to really be responsible for filling that pipeline, right? You just don't go dump a whole bunch of data and it just gets taken care of. You're going to have to write the interrupts uh, to take care of it. This doesn't, it's really not well suited for multiple controllers talking to multiple peripherals. That's not what it's good for. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is really one device talking to another device. Um, you do have to oversample. Uh, and high have higher internal clock frequencies. This was probably a way bigger deal back in the 70s and 80s. Um, but the reality is um, just with the, the efficiencies and the performance of modern uh, processors, you never really have to worry about it. It's not as if the overclocking causes a whole bunch of current consumption or something. Um, you know, it's just the price of that module. The one thing you will have to think about as a designer is making sure that your baud rates are the same on both devices and that your clock sources are accurate and stable. 
Um, again, the HAL drivers will solve most of the choosing the right frequency problems, um, but it's something to good. It's a good thing to keep in the back of your mind. All right. With that, I'll end this module, and then the next module in line is the serial peripheral interfaces. Thanks.